it's really hard to know where to start with The Beginner's Guide. It's a game that seems so very much against the type of in-depth look that I'm offering here, directly warning against the dangers of heavy interpretation, particularly the presumption of authorial intent. But after finishing the game, my mind was set ablaze with dozens of thoughts that wouldn't go away. It was all I could think about at work the next day. The Beginner's Guide still is all I can think about. But approaching it, knowing how to structure this criticism, it's provided a major challenge that I know I'm not alone in. At Offworld.com, Laura Hudson calls The Beginner's Guide a game that doesn't want to be written about. Critic Matt Lee's attempts to talk about the game produced a short video where he explicitly and visibly struggled to explain his emotions and thoughts about his experiences, and Chris Franklin has said that he's horrified to talk about The Beginner's Guide. That's because The Beginner's Guide is not just a game that's going to garner a lot of discussion, but also one that will probably be damaged by all that overexposure. It's a game that seems openly antagonistic to the idea of in-depth analysis and even strong emotional engagement in a way that ensures that any larger discussion about it turns inherently hypocritical. The Beginner's Guide is a game by Davy Reedon, creator of The Stanley Parable, and while the game retains a strong eye for visual design and a powerful understanding of how effective narration is as a storytelling tool, the two games couldn't be more different. The Stanley Parable is a comedic satire about player-object relationships. It's about the player and the game. The Beginner's Guide focuses on player-creator relationships, and it's more of a tragedy than a comedy. In presenting us with the various works of a fellow game designer named Coda, Davy begins to guide us from title to title and tell us his interpretations, easing us along as we move our way from game to game. Ongoing engagement with Coda's works tend to back up Davy's interpretations until the game's great reveal, but the entire affair is tipped off as an exercise in pretension right from the start. We begin with a Counter-Strike map that's really just some experimentation with a level editor, but Davy insists on reading importance into the various oddities of the game space and professes, I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. Yet, in this initial space, there's nothing particularly interesting going on, with the exception of some different textures and a couple of boxes floating in the air. Davy reads excess significance into a space with no actual coherency. He just wants to stress that the space is authored. Coda isn't just a designer, he's an auteur with quirks and idiosyncratic touches that Davy hopes to trace. Quick refresher, auteur theory is a film criticism theory that was started during the French New Wave. It's grounded in François Truffaut's essay Une certaine tendance du cinéma français. The general idea is that the director is not merely somebody staging action, but rather the entire work is tinged and affected by their presence, and that this presence is often found in recurrent formal elements. Games criticism tends to latch on to film criticism language more often than not, and as independent development has allowed less degrees of removal between players and designers, there's been a corresponding rise in thoughts that touch upon auteur theory, although this is also found in AAA spaces with big-name developers. For Davey, the games he shows are not merely games, but also pathways directly to Coda. Understand the game, and you can understand the person. We're given indication very early on that Davy's fascination with the space of Coda's games is fairly superficial. In the second game, Escape from Whisper, we come across a maze, and Davy interjects and jumps the player right to the end. There's really no reason for it that I've ever been able to discern, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip you on past it. Because Davy's not interested in letting the player experience Coda's games for themselves on their own terms. He's interested in letting the player experience his interpretations of them. We either play on his terms, or we don't play at all. This is also made clear when we complete Escape from Whisper. We're first shown what Davy presumes was the intended ending before being shown what is, ostensibly, the real ending, where a glitch tosses us up out of the map boundaries. Two things are being established early on. Davy is talking directly to us, and that form of communication creates an implicit bond of trust. But the fact that Davy is content to jump us about the game space at his leisure attacks our own agency in a way that significantly questions the connection, even if we don't grasp this at first. In these small moments, where Davy aids us to pass through Coda's games, 
He's not only showing a lack of faith in us, the player, but also an unacknowledged disrespect for the work he claims to venerate so much. There's a host of moments where this occurs. The jump through the initial maze in Escape from Whisper, the ability to alter your speed climbing the stairs during nonsense in nearly every direction, the shortening length of time we spend during the prison midway through the great and lovely descent, the cycling through the numerous variations of Coda's prison titles, each moment belies a distrust in the player. This is not our experience, it's Davies, and he's forcing us to partake in it. It's around this time that we have our two real recurring formal elements, the door puzzle and the lamppost. One is a mechanism that facilitates travel through the space. It's a playful take on spatial puzzles that is really the result of somebody who has some familiarity with Half-Life and wants to toss that sort of quirkiness into their games. And the other, as Davy would have it, is a grand destination. For Davy, the light post is a mark that each work is pointing towards something, that there's the implicit promise of something greater and more coherent to the sum total of all the games that Coda has made. I'm going to talk about the lamppost later on with a little bit more focus, but Davy's making a really, really big mistake here, and the mistake is that everything in games must have an inherent purpose or utility. This is a position held by players and critics to a large degree. Players want to believe that everything has a purpose. A great recent example of this in the last, I don't know, five years or so is the Pendant in Dark Souls. It was an item that you could choose to give to your character at the start of the game during character creation, and it was implied that it would unlock some sort of secret when all it really was was just a pendant. Players fixated on it. It had to have some meaning, you know, right? It had to unlock a treasure chest somewhere or let you open a secret door, but it didn't. Similarly, there's a critical compulsion to assume that games are lean things, devoid of excess fat. Davy's making the mistake of assuming that Coda's work has to have a deeper meaning, and we begin to make that same mistake as two games are presented to us. This game is always online, and the prison game, Porn Stars Die Too. The two games begin to show apparent lapses in Coda's creative drive. This place makes me sad. Recognize me, please. I would very much like to be desired. I am compelled. Next time, I will do better. There's all sorts of phrases that are found in the more innocuous ones that are in This Game Is Always Online, and because all of these notes are actually written by Coda, the game isn't really online, we start to wonder how much strain the creative process might be having on him. The preoccupation with the prison game structure calls back to these messages and creates a semiotic focal point for them, an environment where we and Davy begin to presume that Coda must be feeling trapped. If we're supposed to see games as aspects of their creators, as extensions of the people who are making them, then what else are we supposed to expect? It's a bit manipulative in order to facilitate the twist that comes later on, but the general point is still made. In presuming motive in art, we tend to make emotional and personal judgments about creators that have no real basis or grounding in reality, and the Beginner's Guide really wants us to make these sorts of hasty judgments. It preys on our empathy and then weaponizes it, which might be one of the reasons that some people feel so indicted by it, but we'll get to that later on. The final prison game ends with a conversation with your past self, and among the options is to tell yourself that the only way to escape the prison is to be sincere. In order to escape, you need to be authentic. It's something of an antipiece for the solution to the game Mobius Trip. That game is intended to be played with your eyes closed, but players will probably disregard that either of their own volition or at Davy's behest. In it, the only way to stop the imminent destruction of your ship is to tell the truth. You need to be sincere, to open up and admit that the creative process is draining, that you can't keep making any more games. Before all of this, there's a notable interlude of sorts, a game where you wander around a cabin and clean. You do the dishes, make the bed, and chat with another housekeeper. When I got to this point, I cried. And my telling you that means nothing unless I can identify why that is. 
Some of it is formal. Structurally, the process of repetition is very relaxing. Much like repetition as a rhetorical device in written art, repetition in games can give the affair a certain efficacy that it's very much tangible. And by that I mean there's actually like repeated muscle movements that you feel. I move about the keyboard and click. I move about the keyboard and then click. There's a certain rhythm in this section that's not afforded by the hallway structure of most of the previous games. And the environment is also deliberately constructed to feel safe. Or at least it gives off that effect. There's snow outside, but the inside is warm, inviting, and friendly. I'd also bought into Davy's narrative by now. Games with a lot of narration tend to speak at the player and not to them. It's almost ironic given Davy's over-identification with Coda, but I was also identifying with Davy. I've worked on games and I know the feeling of burnout, and I've seen so many people driven away from the space for all kinds of reasons. Coda's story rang true, and Davy wasn't talking at me, he was talking to me. He was telling me a story, letting me into his world and sharing things with me. His relief was my relief. I was... I was so happy for Coda. I was so happy for Davy. It felt like all three of us were on the same page, which was a terrible lie. The game's big revelation is masterful. I'm the reason that you stopped making games, aren't I? It's because of what I did. I poisoned it for you. After playing through more games, including one that seems to be about performance anxiety and another about tearing down your own creations, which includes a stunning return of the gun we used in Escape from Whisper, we make our way through the tower. It's a game so obtuse and challenging that we might call it spiteful. Does Coda hate games that much? No. Coda is trying to keep Davy away. Davy brute forces his way through an invisible maze and a massive combination lock in order to see the rest of this game. There's a miniature betrayal before the big one. That wonderfully meditative game about cleaning? It was supposed to go on forever. It didn't end naturally. Davy took me from that place. And at the top of the tower, we learn all. Davy has been showing Coda's games against his wishes, altering them to provide through lines and thematic connections that were never there. That lamppost? That's not Coda looking for a destination, it's Davy looking for a purpose. Davy put those in Coda's games. It's Davy trying to create a narrative about his friends, if Davy and Coda can even be called that. Every emotion I felt about Coda, all the narrative that I'd bought into, it was all lies. It's a massive change. Not only was I complicit in projecting things onto Coda, but I was also complicit in Davy's lies, willingly or not. Worse, I can never know how much of what I experienced of Coda's games were the real deal. Davy might have altered small things, and there's no indication of how far-reaching and invisible these changes really are. That's a huge betrayal, and it relies on the authoritative trust that I gave to Davy because he acknowledged me as a player, and let me have a conversation with him. Davy, the character, was talking to me, so I trusted him. But Davy, the designer, knew that I would listen and trust. That last sentence I just said is the major problem that comes from looking at the beginner's guide. If this is a game where Coda rejects Davy's authoritative interpretations and is ultimately driven away by the ways in which Davy you know, imposes his own meaning onto his spaces and games. I'm participating in the same damn thing right now with Davey Redden, the real-world game designer. That hypocrisy creates a very deep tension that might be hard for some players to contextualize healthily, and it seems to suggest that the beginner's guide is anti-interpretation. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I think imaginative interpretation of art is one of the main purposes of art itself, and the general takeaway that I get from the Beginner's Guide isn't that having imaginative interpretations is the issue, but rather that seeking objective truths about games, and especially their designers, creates intense problems. 
With social media and other venues allowing us easy contact with creators, a consumer culture that says that the customer is always right, and a critical sphere that wants to paint certain forms of criticism as inherently more valid than others, it gets really easy for people to become prescriptive about games, and even combatively overprotective about their creators. Davies' sin isn't interpretation. It's a type of ludic zealotry that deifies Coda and seeks to validate the games that he likes and the interpretations that he has. His sin comes from thinking that he knows Coda so well that he can alter Coda's games and create a narrative, all because he wrongheadedly wants to help a friend who isn't even stuck in a prison, but just really likes designing them. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and a glitch is just a glitch. A lot of conversation about this game is going to be water cooler talk. How much did Davy change? Who made the epilogue sequence? Why is it even called the beginner's guide? All of these vectors for interpretation will cause us to, you know, just as I have now, discuss the game enough to possibly devalue it altogether. And if I say that's the point, I'm being just as sinful as Davy was. At the end of the day, all we're left with is a game, our interpretations, and the hope that maybe we'll not fall into the traps that we fell into while playing Coda's games and having Davy lie to us. The understanding that not everything needs perfect structure, but can be left messy and flawed. That we can reconcile our love of a thing with the guilt that might come from loving it too much. That we can, panicked or not, Understand that while we all seek validation in some form, we can't force it. We can't lie and manipulate and tear things apart in the pursuit of that validation. We need to learn to just let go. And maybe that's the thing that we're supposed to be beginning.